guys, I'm Linda. And I'm Vicki. And we are Partners, Partners in Crime. In Crime. Well, the other recommendation we received, one of the other recommendations we received was from Sylvia Seely. And Sylvia recommended that we talk about Sharon, or Sharon, Morningstar Keenan. Mm -hmm. And Sylvia is really interested because she said this little girl, who was nine years old, forever will be nine years yeah. old, was um, in the town that she's from. And she was around the same age when this happened, so oh, she has wow. a lot of interest in it. Yeah. So thank you, Sylvia, and we did look up some information on it to see what we could find, mm -hmm. and it turns out that this little girl, nine years old, um, she was uh, with her mother uh, most of the day, this particular day, uh, it was January 23rd, 1983. Mm -hmm. She, um, after, she, after being with her mother, she wanted to go play in the park. Apparently, she's been there many times mm -hmm. before. And um, this was about 3 or 3.30 that she went to the park. And her mother had told her, be home by 4 o'clock. Sharon had a watch on and would know the time and was pretty good about coming home when she was told to. Mm -hmm. uh, so when she didn't get home at four, her father went out to search for her at the park and couldn't find her. Uh, and then he called the police. The name of the park, and I do have that, um, is the Jean Syllabius Park. And and what area was this in again? What this is city? Toronto. Okay, Toronto, Canada. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where, um, Sh I'm going to say Sharon, it's... Sharon or Sharon mm -hmm. was a fourth grade student at the Jesse Ketchum Public Elementary School. And I'm sure Sylvia is aware of that because that's the town that she came from. Mm -hmm. um, after they called the police, the police did an extensive search. Of course, to no avail, they couldn't find her. Mm -hmm. And about nine days later, Search was still going on, but nine days later, they decided to do a door-to-door -door search in the, in the neighborhood because they weren't getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, they did come about a, and this is on February 1st, they came upon a boarding home where um, they were able to get in and find little Sharon's body and a refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, a room rented by Dennis Melvin Howe. Now, and Sylvia, I don't know if you'll recognize the name of the street. It's Brunswick Avenue. Mm -hmm. That's where the boarding house was. Um, they found that she had been sexually assaulted and strangled. A nine-year-old girl. Yeah. So, and the family lived several blocks away. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just heartbreaking yeah, yeah. so close and it took them that long to find her right and that's a whole other story because you know people were claiming that the police botched it because you know their investigation was taking so long mm -hmm. and you know then there's this huge search for for this Hal guy they couldn't find him no matter what they did they couldn't find him and I'll go on with more information about that um the uh, homicide detective kept the secret, and the secret was kept until about 2010, and he revealed that there was a dollar bill that was found in her clothing. Oh. And they think that uh, Dennis Howe lured her with the dollar bill oh. to get her into, the, into his boarding house. 
So one of the other reasons they're considering it botched because mm-hmm. he held on to this information. Maybe he didn't, but it just wasn't publicized. Right. Um, so Hale had an extensive criminal background. He had spent at least 20 years in prison. And it was for uh, abuses against women. Mm-hmm. And he had spent the last 15 years in, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to say this right, Saskatchewan. 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 Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I've heard of that before. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, in a prison uh, there. Hmm. And that's his real name? Melvin. Uh, Dennis Melvin Howe. Okay. That's not an alias then. Not, no, because they kept looking for this individual, and they okay. found some of his family as mm-hmm. well. So, um, he was released uh, on supervision, kind of like parole, mm-hmm. and he took off after the, the death of this little girl, and um, wasn't showing up for his supervision. He just disappeared. And they did find out that he had a stepbrother. Uh, his name was Eugene. So when he got out of prison, which was Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan <laughs> um, his brother, his stepbrother, had sent him money. And that's how he, he moved to Toronto mm. and unfortunately met up with this little girl. Um, this is after being in prison for 15 years mm-hmm. for crimes about assaulting women and girls. Right. Mm. A little background about about uh, Dennis Melvin Howe. He was divorced in 1967 and did not have any children from that marriage. But it's they think he had a a child out of wedlock from an from a relationship he had in 1969. And, um, you know, they investigated all these people. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until a month, and this is another reason that they, people were so hard on him, on these detectives. The, yeah. It wasn't until a month after she was killed that Hal was identified as the alleged killer. Mm-hmm. Now... I don't know what took them so long. They didn't get into that. They knew it was his room. DNA was used in those days. So I I don't know what took them so long. Mm -hmm. Plus, he had a record. He had a record. He was in prison. Right. Yeah. So I don't don't understand that. And DNA was big back then? It was, yeah. it It was, I don't know how thorough it was back then. But they did use it. So I'm not, I'm not sure what happened. They didn't get into that in Mm -hmm. this article. Got it. Um, They have him last seen in St. Marie, Ontario. And this was the day after she just appeared, getting on a bus, transferring to Winnipeg. Mm. Uh, Through the years, Leads, plenty of leads. Leads disappeared. They followed up on so many things. Um, It was like he was a ghost. Mm. They just couldn't find him. Uh, The police even put out a bulletin to dentist because he he had such bad teeth and he was always using Origel. How they knew that, I don't know. Right. But he was always in the gel and he had such bad teeth that they thought he would be inclined to see a dentist. Okay. In fact, one dentist thought he had him in his chair. Oh, wow. And the police came and it turned out it wasn't him. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, in 1999, a tip led, another tip, another false lead, to a cemetery where they believed Hal was buried, that he was dead already. Mm. And the cemetery, uh, the person was buried under the name of, 
Let me find it. Peter Sanderson. They exhumed him. Did DNA. Mm -hmm. It wasn't him. him. And that was in 1999, so mm -hmm. they were doing DNA. Yeah. So, I don't know. In 1983, when this happened, how sophisticated DNA was. It probably wasn't, and that's why they saved right. some samples just for right. the future, which is a good thing that some of these departments, police, are saving that sort of thing. Right. Now... You know, Hal had a lot of family out west, and when they say out west, <clears throat> they're talking about the United States. And there are unanswered questions about what they knew. Mm. Hal's half-brother, Eugene, is the one who gave him the money to go to Toronto, was making periodic trips, quite a few, to places like... Um, uh, out west. They were places like Montana and Washington State. And when the police questioned him about that, he stopped making the trips. Mm. So they think maybe he was visiting. Giving him or supplies. Giving him whatever. Sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. In those areas of the country, I mean, they're very rural areas that they could, he could have been hiding out somewhere and maybe his, right. his stepbrother or half-brother was right. actually keeping him um, right. alive. Helping, yeah, to yeah. survive. Yeah. And then, whatever he knew, he took to the grave. He died in 2004. Mm. And no answers. So, another brother, his name was Clayton, said the police never questioned him until 10 years later. Oh my goodness. So... He, they, he had a two, two sisters as well who were also claiming they knew nothing. They haven't had, they, they've been estranged for years. Mm -hmm. They didn't know anything. They knew Eugene had given him money, but that's all they knew about. Right. Uh, one of the investigators on the case, after four years, and this was uh, Detective Mike Pedley, because of all the comments that they were receiving, all the negative comments, mm -hmm. and he was also one of them who found his bo her body, he um, committed suicide. Ugh. So this whole thing, this murder, destroyed a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, her parents uh, separated when this occurred. I don't know how long after it occurred. Yeah, they went, I can understand they, why they went their own way. Toll. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the other detective who found the body, uh, his name was Captain Brian Lowry. He was with the force nine and a half years, but after that, he just quit. He, mm -hmm. he couldn't take anymore. Yeah. And he started his own business um, helping people with traffic tickets. Okay. Um, so, you know, it did take its toll on, on many lives and many people. Um, in 2017, this is 30 years after her death, they're still searching. Mm. And because of the visits to the West from Eugene, mm -hmm. And led the police to do a further investigation in the, that area. Mm -hmm. And they found somebody going under the name of Robert Miller. And you can see, and I don't know, maybe we can put it in the video, a composite of what he would have looked like, what Hal would have looked like, and what Robert Miller looked like. And mm -hmm. it's very similar, very yeah. similar. And it was also said that um, Hal could fix anything. He was a whiz at mechanics and could fix anything. Well, this particular person, going by the name of Robert Miller, had an appliance repair store. Yeah. So there were a lot of circumstantial things that led them to believe that it was him. Mm -hmm. um, but they questioned him, they, they took fingerprints, they took his birth certificate, 
How about DNA? Did right. they ask right. for that? I don't know because that wasn't mentioned and I wondered that myself. Yeah. But in a strange twist, Robert was watching an episode of America's Most Wanted. Mm. And and Dennis Howe was featured. Oh, okay. So Robert claimed that he recognized Dennis Howe as being somebody who was a drifter who had lived in a, in a um, not a boarding house, a, a home for um, homeless people? Yeah, pretty much, but okay. I don't know what they called like it. Like a shelter. A shelter. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> he lived in a shelter, mm -hmm. and um, he had done some small jobs for Robert Miller. Mm. Robert Miller had some of his belongings. He had toothbrushes and some clothing and the duffel bag and... Um, yeah, like you said, coincidence? I don't, I don't think know. so. But anyway... Especially um, since he looks like him. Yeah. And, you know, it's not exact, but you can see the similarity. Right, right. and it's how many years later. Right. So, Robert Miller claimed that they arrested this person who was going by the name of Tommy Ross. Mm -hmm. And when they arrested him, they put him in a plane to take him back home and they murdered him. They threw him out of the plane. <laughs> Who's, who? Who threw him out of the plane? The, the, the investigators, the police that arrested him, threw him out of the plane. Oh my goodness gracious. So, I mean, the suspicion was growing on Robert Miller yeah. all the time. And, um, what kind of plane were they in? I don't know. An army plane? Like, that's the only thing you could throw somebody out of. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how he knew that. I don't know. <laughs> oh my goodness. But anyway, uh, it backfired on Robert Miller because, um, they believed that he was indeed Dennis Hamm. I would, I would surmise that as well <laughs> but I don't know why how or when but they eventually cleared Robert Miller wow and many believe because it's so many he was he was 73 years old at when it was 30 years later and they were investigating in you know the western United States mm-hmm they're just thinking he's dead because they haven't been able to find him. Yeah. Well, he was thrown out of the plane. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, but that, whoever that person was, if oh, he even existed, I... you know, who knows? What a story. I know. Just such an interesting story. And I can see why Sylvia had such interest in it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's just a shame. I hope that at some point her parents get some kind of resolution to this. I don't know how they will at this point because mm -hmm. so many years have gone by and, you know, they seem to have botched a lot of things. Yeah. And I don't know how much they can follow up on at this point. Right. Right. So, sad story. A very Definitely. sad story. Anytime, well, any murder, but when it comes to children, ugh. It just, it's right, and you know so that's much worse. that's what got me interested in this story when I started searching around some of the recommendation mm -hmm. was because it was a kid, yeah, and it just kills me when these kids are sexually abused and murdered, mm -hmm. and people are sick enough to do that. Right. Thank God, though, that the family has resolution because they did find her. Well, they did find her, right. That is where we right. have looked at other um, stories where the child, unfortunately, has never been found. Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, again, thank you, Sylvia. Yes, thanks, thank Sylvia. everybody for all the recommendations we're mm -hmm. getting. Yep. And, um... All you guys out there, we want you to be part of our true crime family. Mm -hmm. So please subscribe, comment, give us a thumbs up, mm -hmm. and share. Yes. Because we want to get a lot of people 
involved in giving us more recommendations and mm -hmm. lots of feedback for what we're doing. Yes. So, and please do comment on our videos and let us know. Mm hmm And I do want to, doing this story that uh, Vicki just talked about, it prompted me to, you know, I thought, oh, I've never known anything like this to happen around me, but... I think the next next week we're going to do a story that actually happened in our area. It was many years ago, and it was uh, regarding Lisa Mandarak and um, her daughter yes. and their murder. And I actually have um, kind of a what's the the word? I relationship. Do, not a relationship, but I have been and might have actually interacted with the murderer or their family member without um, knowing. At their store. Yes, there right. was a, a, a store in the area that mm -hmm. the family owned. So I think we're gonna work on that for next week. That's a great Amongst idea. other ones. So, That's a great um, and I will go out to, there are different, they look different now. The store isn't there, but it's the same strip mall so I can, um, show you where this happened and there is a park in the area as well dedicated to them and I will show you the park right and I so. believe the little girl was a baby mm -hmm. uh, they found her body and I don't get too much into it but at Valley Forge National Park mm -hmm. Which is in our area and pretty well known. Yeah, yep. and it wasn't too far from actually the store. The store where they were murdered. Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah. So look out for that. We're going to go into that next week, and then amongst other things, and then any updates uh, with the big cases that we're looking into, we will definitely bring that to you as well. Great. All right. Mm -hmm. And we also have another Netflix series that we're going to dive into with our guests. Keith and Marjorie again, so look out for that as well. I'm All looking right. forward to that one. All right. Well, until next time, bye. bye.